So if you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, let me invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 10. And it's always a good time when we get to gather around the Word of God. Amen. So this season of Advent, as the uh, Williams um, lit the third candle today, as we celebrate uh, the Advent season, um, if you're, if you're new to the, the season of Advent, it's important to understand, Advent is a word that means arrival or the coming of someone or something that's significant. During these weeks leading up to Christmas, we're spending each Sunday specifically thinking about the coming of Jesus. And this, this season, we've been really spending time talking about the incarnation of Christ. Just the idea and the significance of, of King Jesus leaving the heavens and coming to earth and what that means to our faith. And so today I can't wait to walk with you through um, what I believe is the beautiful, beautiful text in Mark chapter 10. Um, so if you look at Mark chapter 10, you see a lot at play here if you're looking at verses 35 through 45. Uh, today, though, we have the incredible news to share with you from Mark 10 that I believe for most followers of Jesus, they don't really actually realize. Like I told you before, I think sometimes we fast forward through the Advent season in the anticipation of, of the, the death and the resurrection of Christ, which are, as I've shared with you over and over again, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single most important moment in history of mankind. Jesus walking out of that grave. But not far under it is Jesus being born, leaving the heavens, coming to earth, and being born um, is significant. And that's why we were talking about the incarnation. I have good news, I believe, that will help and encourage you deeply today from Mark 10. And if you, if you find yourself in this room today and you're not a follower of Jesus, I have incredible news to share with you that will show you how wonderfully different Christianity is from all the other religions of the world. So let's dive in. Here's how I want to set things up, though. If Advent refers to the coming of Jesus, then today I want to ask the question, why? Why did Jesus come? So let's start in Mark, 30, Mark chapter 10, verse 35. Then we're going to camp out on verse 45 at length. What I believe is one of the most breathtaking verses in the entire Bible. But let's take a look at the context that leads up to it. So read with me Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to baptize with the baptism in which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. That's bold. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared. And when he had heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, 
And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Let me pray for us. Holy Father, we praise you for your word today. Lord, we as, as your body, as the body of Christ here and, and this little white church here in Grand County, Lord, we um, stand united, Lord, on the truth of your word this morning. And Lord, we know according to the, the text that was proclaimed last week that, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so we know that the truth of the advent, the truth of the incarnation, of you leaving the heavens and coming to earth, Lord, is that you came as the Word of God. All all the wisdom of all humanity, of all eternity, Lord, made manifest in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, for that we celebrate today. For that truth we celebrate today, Lord, and I ask above all things, Lord, that you hide me behind the truth of the word today. That any opinion that I may express today will be long forgotten and that the truth of your word would stand and stand alone, Father. Lord, I do ask that for through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would do what I am unable to do, and that's to transform lives today. Father, for those who are in this room that are struggling with this truth of Christianity, Lord, I pray that that you would remove the veil from their eyes. And for those that are just struggling with with the struggles of life, Father, I pray that they, they draw near to you and cling to you as the only hope that there is. Father, we ask that you do amazing things today. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. So there it is in verse 45. Read that again. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Underline it in your Bible. Star it in your Bible. Highlight it in your Bible. Memorize it. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is the reason that we gather for Advent. That is the reason for the Christmas story. But today what I want to show you is through this text, answering the question, why did Jesus come? I think that we see five reasons here according to this one verse in verse 45. Each one of these five reasons, in my opinion, is awesome. I want to personalize these for you, though. I want you to feel the weight and the wonder of why Jesus came. The first one is this. Jesus came to suffer like you. Jesus uses a title for himself in verse 45 where he calls himself the Son of Man, a title that emphasizes how Jesus is indeed a man, a fully human person like us. Now that seems pretty simple if you've grown up in the church, but I think we miss this. I think we have a tendency to think about Jesus as being so different from us. Obviously, he is in one sense because Jesus is God who has existed before time. That's clear in verse 45 with the phrase, the Son of Man came. We know the miracle of the incarnation. I mean, who of us decided to come into the world? None of us, right? But he did. Which one of us was sitting around one day and saying, hmm, I think I'll go into the world now. No one. We don't talk like this because we didn't exist before we entered the world. But Jesus did. 
And it's really important. These finite foundational truths of our faith are so important during this season. Jesus did because Jesus is God. He decided to come. He came as a human just like us. I don't think we fully realize this. Just listen to us at Christmas and some of our favorite Christmas carols. I'm going to be stomping on toes here for a minute, okay? Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright. I love that song, right? We'll sing that on Christ- we'll sing it next weekend, I know, on our Christmas, morning, Christmas Eve morning service and our Eve service. I'm certain that'll be a part of it. I love the way it sounds. I love the way that it makes me feel, right? There's a lot of nostalgia, right, on Silent Night. You've heard it. But anybody who has ever had a baby knows that it's not the way it works, right? Right, baby Cora? It's not the way it works. There is no Silent Night. Babies don't come out silent, and they don't stay silent. Holy, yes, this child was. Silent, no way. But screaming night, holy night, just doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? It just doesn't. Or how about away in a manger? The cattle are lowing, the poor baby wakes, But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Seriously? When was the last time you saw a newborn baby wake up next to a cow and not be a bit bothered by it? I mean, Jeff, does that happen? No. Now, my point here is not to ruin Christmas carols. So don't, don't. Don't put me in that corner. I'm not doing that. By all means, sing them. We will sing them together. We'll sing them here. But don't let them mask the reality is the point. Jesus was a baby. He was a real baby like we were all real babies at one point. That means he cried. That means he wanted food. That means he needed sleep like us. This is so important on a deeper level. I want you to think about it. Two weeks ago, we talked about physical hurt, emotional hurt, relational hurt that was experienced because of the sin in the garden. I want to remind us that Jesus came to this world and he experienced all of those things like us. I would actually argue he even experienced greater hurt than we do. This is so important because while we rightfully think of Jesus as different from us, that can easily cause us to think that Jesus is distant from our lives. But he's not, church. Are you hurting today? Because guess what? Jesus hurt. Are you broken? Jesus was broken. Are you tired? Jesus was tired. Have you ever felt let down by people that you trusted? Jesus was let down. Do you grieve? Jesus grieved. Do you ever cry out because you feel like you just can't take it anymore? Jesus was full of sorrows, crying out to God in desperation in the garden. Whatever physical, emotional, or relational hurt you have, hear this good news. You do not have a God today who is distant from your pain. You have a God who is familiar with your pain. He's suffering with your hurt, sorrow, and suffering. I love what Corey Ten Boon wrote in the depths of a Nazi death camp. She wrote, No matter how deep our darkness, He is deeper still. 
No matter how deep our darkness, He is deeper still. Jesus came to suffer like us. We could stop here and this would be glorious. But it gets even better, church. It gets even better. So the second thing you must understand of why Jesus came is that Jesus came to die instead of you. Jesus came to suffer like you. Then the second reason, he came to die instead of you. The Son of Man came to give his life. Verse 45 again. He gave his life as a ransom to many. This is an interesting phrase when you think about it. When Jesus is talking about giving his life, he's talking about giving, he's talking about his death. What he's saying here is that he came to die. What he's saying here is that he was born to die. If you turn back a couple chapters to Mark chapter 8, and you look at verse 31, just to give some more context, the first half of Mark's gospel is spent following Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Then the transition takes place in chapter 8. From chapter 8 to chapter 10, Jesus travels to Jerusalem where he's going to be crucified. I want you to hear what he says not once, but twice and three times on his way to Jerusalem. Look at Mark 8.31. It says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. Then turn over to Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 31, and look what it says. They went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, He will rise. Now turn to Mark 10, our chapter today, and look at what Jesus said right before the passage we read, starting in verse 32. It says, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them, what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. Jesus knew what was going on here. He knew he was going to his death. The very reason he came in the first place. This is very different. I want you to think about it, though. For us, death is an unavoidable outcome that we dread and fear. It is. But for Jesus, death was his unshakable purpose in coming in the first place. It's what... He was anticipating. Mark 10, 45 reminds us that the death of Jesus was not the tragic end, though. That's what's beautiful about the story of Christ. Don't just think about the difference between Jesus and us. Think about the difference between Jesus here and every other religious leader in in world history. For other religious leaders, their death was the tragic end of their story. Every one of them. The focus in every other world religion is on the the leader's life and teachings. Whomever it may have been. Muhammad died. Confucius died. Buddha died. Even Moses died at 120 years old. 
The death of each of these leaders marks the end of their mission, but church, not so with Jesus. That's not the story of the Christ. With Jesus, it's the total opposite. Jesus was constantly talking about his death. Anticipating his death. Foretelling his death in such a way that the central symbol of Christianity for the past 2,000 years has been what? The cross. A place of death. And the cross is the point. It's why he came. Jesus came to die instead of us. Now, what does that mean exactly? When you look at the end of Mark 10, 45, you see the word for. Very important. Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. The word for there in the original language of the New Testament literally means instead of or in place of. So put together with what we talked about a few weeks ago. Why do we die? We die because of sin. When Adam and Eve took of the fruit, they died spiritually and then would would die physically. That was not the original creation of God and His people. They would live eternally with Him. They would not face physical death. But because of sin, we die. Because the sin in our lives and in the world around us. Because of sin, we're separated from God. So we will experience eventual physical death. If we die separated from God, we will experience eternal spiritual death. But Jesus came to change all of that. So hear this incredible news today, especially if you're not a follower of Jesus today. Each person has sinned against God, so he is in fact separated from God. If you die separated from God, you will spend eternity separated from him. But the good news, the gospel of the Bible is that Jesus came to die for you instead of you. In spite of you sometimes. You deserve to experience eternal spiritual death. But Jesus came to pay the price of death for you. Hallelujah. You say, well, how can a man pay the price of eternal spiritual death? It's a good question. It's a significant question. That's the beauty of who Jesus is. He was fully man. Remember that. Which means he's able to stand in your place. And he's fully God, which means he's able to bear divine infinite judgment. Jesus is the perfect substitute for sinners. Which means that when, we put your, when you put your faith in him... And what he did on the cross, instead of you, you can be saved from this eternal death. Jesus came to die instead of you. Man, we're only two reasons in out of this text. Isn't this good? Y'all better get buckled in. Good thing we got a good lunch waiting on us. We're going to need it. The third thing that we've got to understand about why Jesus came is that Jesus came to set you free from the slavery of sin. Jesus came to give us his life as a ransom, as Mark 10.45 says. That word ransom is lutron, which refers to the payment given to the release of someone from slavery or to buy their freedom. So here's the picture. Each one of us are slaves to sin. Each one of us is prone to sin, which means you're prone to choose your way over God. It's like we can't help it, right? You're a slave to yourself in that sense, wanting what you want 
over what God wants, right? Even when you realize that what God wants for you is better, and even when sin can prove to be costly in your life, you're still a slave to it and its effects. But Jesus came to change that. Jesus came to set you free from the slavery of sin. You see, I don't think we dive into, uh, deep enough into this idea is we know that he came to save us from sin, but he came also to deliver you from the slavery of sin. Those are two different things. I think many of us don't, we don't talk about this enough. I talk with so many self-professing Christians who basically see themselves functionally as slaves to sin, as if it's just a club to join. They see themselves as slaves to anger. They see themselves as slaves to worry, slaves to lust and desire for all kinds of things of this world apart from God. They're slaves to selfishness. And we could go on and on and on. But without question, as long as we're in this world, we will struggle with sin. But the good news of the Bible is this. Jesus, Jesus didn't just die so that you could be forgiven from sin's penalty. Jesus came to conquer sin in his life, to conquer sin in his death, to conquer sin in his resurrection from the grave then to put the power of the Holy Spirit inside you right now. Jesus came to set you free from the slavery of sin. So the next time that the devil tells you that you can't overcome this sin or that temptation, you must realize at church that it's a lie. Because you're equipped to overcome it. I'm reminded of 1 John 4.4. 4. It says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And 1 John 5.4 says, Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Jesus came to set you free from the slavery of sin. Church, that sin is not a master over you anymore. Stop walking in it as if it is. There's three reasons why Jesus came. But it just keeps getting better. The fourth reason Jesus came is to show you how to love. According to Mark 10.45, it says, Jesus came to show you how to love this is why it's so important to read the context of this verse, not just read the verse by itself. In this passage, Jesus is saying to his disciples who were seeking what? Greatness, right? You want to be great? Here's how you become great. You become a servant of others. Here's how you become first. You become last. You lay down your life for others. This is revolutionary, church. It's a strong and needed word in our culture today. Especially for each one of us in this room, if, you're in any, if the Lord has brought you into any sort of leadership position where you have the opportunity to lead people and guess what? If, if the Lord has given you a child through birth, guess what? You're leading them. This is revolutionary and it's needed for our culture. If you're in a leadership position, if you're in the position of a parent over one person, a couple of people, or multitudes of people, you're called to lead in your home and your family and your work and your community. He's saying to you right now, do not lord your leadership over those you lead. 
Do not aggressively assert your authority over them. Jesus is saying to you, lead with love. Lead by serving. Lead not by asserting others over others, but by sacrificing yourself for others. Jesus says, see yourself as a slave. Things look radically different when leaders today lead according to these words from Jesus. But I can already hear some people thinking. I can hear you thinking out loud. Isn't that weird? That sounds good, Chris. But that's preposterous. You can't lead that way. To see yourself as another slave, that's crazy talk. Well, it is pretty crazy. Yet it leads to the last reason that Jesus came. According to Mark 10, 45, and this one I believe is the most profound. This one is is over the top, and it almost feels blasphemous to say, but I'm going to say it because Jesus said it. And the fifth reason that Jesus came is he came to be your servant. Hear this in your life. Jesus came to be your servant, to be your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. The word for serve there literally means to wait on tables. To get this, when Jesus is looking for the word to describe why he came to you and me, he says, I came to wait on you. Think about that. You go to a restaurant and somebody comes to your table and asks, how can I help you? What can I get for you? How can I serve you? Jesus says, that's why I came. To say that to you, how can I help you? How can I get you? I am your servant. God in the flesh says that to you. And this is crazy. And no other religious figure ever talked like this. This sounds crazy to us until we realize that it's not crazy. It's Christianity. It is the foundation of how we live. This is Christ. Jesus did not come as some person to meet all your personal whims, though. That's what's the interesting context of the, of the argument there, right? He says there in verse 36, And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit at your right hand and one at your left, right? They wanted all the glory. But Jesus didn't come to meet your personal whims, right? Jesus came to be a lowly servant of you and me. Jesus told his followers, and he's telling his followers today right now, that he did not come so that we might serve him. He came to serve us. Jesus is saying, in my relationship with you, I am the servant. I serve you. I work for you. I wait on you. Doesn't this sound... Blasphemous? But it's not. It's the way that it's stated in the Scriptures. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5-7. through It says, Jesus, who was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now let's, let's provide some clarity to this. The Bible does not mean when it says Jesus is our servant. It doesn't mean we tell Jesus whatever we want him to do and he automatically does it. That's, not what, that's what James and John were arguing about, really. That's what they wanted. Jesus was not their servant in that way. That would be a perversion of what Jesus is saying here. This does not mean that there isn't a sense in which we are servants of Jesus because we know that we are. We see that in the other points of Scripture as well. Paul repeatedly calls himself a servant of Christ Jesus. 
Disciples are, in a sense, servants of Jesus. But follow what Jesus is saying here in Mark 10. Because in many ways, this is the essence of Christianity. I'm, I'm convinced, though, many Christians miss this in their daily life, though. Think about how someone becomes a Christian, right? How do you become a follower of Christ Jesus? The Christian life begins the moment you, you or I stop trying to be God and we start serving God. The Christian life believe, begins when we are granted a faith to believe. The Christian life begins at the moment when you realize you have sin in your heart against God and there's no amount of good that you can do to cover it. No matter how many times you go to church, read the Bible, pray, live a moral life, show kindness to others, do good works, on and on and on and on and on. If you do all of these things in your life, you still cannot cover the stain of sin in your heart before God. When we see Mark, Mark 10 Verse 45, it says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom of many. This shows us, it reminds us that we need God to cover the stain of our sin. This means that you need God to do something for you. You need God to serve you. You need God to cover over that stain of sin. You need God to forgive you from your sin, to free you from your sin. You need God to serve you in this way. And Jesus says, that's why I came. Not to be served by you, but to serve you. If you have ever asked God to serve you in that way, I invite you to do so today. Hear and believe this good news today, church. God has brought you here today because he wants to serve you. He wants to forgive you of all your sin, to free you from the slavery of it, to give you eternal life with Him. That's why Jesus came. You can ask Jesus to serve you, to save you from your sin, and He will. He wants to serve you today. Christians, please get this, because this is key to our foundational belief of Christianity. Once you ask Jesus to serve you in this way, to save you from your sin, you don't then move on from needing to be served by Jesus. No, the Christian life becomes a life of daily being served by Jesus. Jesus said earlier in this chapter in Mark 10, 15, he says, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is the heart of Christianity. Jesus did not come in search of servants who would help him out. Jesus came to serve. And you can't live without him serving you. It totally misses the point to begin a relationship with God through Jesus by trusting Him to save you. But then rising up and trying to live out the Christian life on your own. It doesn't work, church. Don't do it. Jesus did not come ultimately to be served by you, but to serve you. It makes sense when you really think about it. Because everything in the Christian life depends on Jesus serving you. Everything. Everything. Think about it. What is prayer? When we're praying, are we not saying, God, I need your help? God, I'm going through this or I'm going through that. I need your help. Or praying for someone else. This person, that person is going through. I need your help. Prayer is asking God to serve us. Asking God to help us in these ways and wait on us in these ways. And God has told us to do that. God actually delights in us doing that. He said, ask me to serve you in this way, and I will give you everything if you ask in my name. 
Think about reading and understanding the Bible. We can't do that on our own, can we? We need God's Spirit to help us understand the Bible. So whenever we open it, we ask God to serve us, to help us understand it. Think about different facets of your life. I think about parenting conversations that Andrea and I have nonstop, it seems. Every night we're just looking up and each conclusion ends in the same conclusion. God help us. Right? I just plead, God, please help me be the best husband and dad possible. Truth be told, I pray for you in the same way. I was praying this morning, Lord, I don't know how to be a good pastor for each of these people. I plead for God to help to make me the pastor you need me to be. I think about these decisions all week. And when I'm just pleading for God's wisdom, I think about the struggles where I'm just pleading for God's grace. I need God to serve me all day long. And so do you. At this point, some of you might think, yep, this is the problem with Christianity. Christianity is for the weak. Christianity is for those who need a crutch, who cannot do it on their own. Some might even think, I don't need God to serve me. I get up early every morning. I work hard in my job. I provide and care for my family. I make all kinds of decisions every day. I do all kinds of good things. I don't doubt that you do. But let me ask you a question. Where did you get your breath this morning? Who provided the food and water to get you through the day? Where did you get the ability to work hard? Who made it possible for you to have a family? Ladies and gentlemen, there's not one person in this gathering today that's self sufficient. You're not. You may think that you are, but you're not. Every person in this gathering is ultimately God-dependent. Even if you hate God, the reality is your very breath at this moment comes from the one that you hate. Every one of you needs God to serve you. Your relationship with God begins with realizing that. Then it continues moment by moment, day by day, with that realization. And the great news of the Bible is that God desires to do this for you. This is the mammoth meaning of Christmas. Jesus came to serve. Jesus came to take away all of your sin and help you in your struggles. Think about it. In all your struggles with sin... Jesus right now, today, and this week, wants to serve. In all of your struggles with worry, Jesus wants to serve you in those. In all of your struggles with anger, lust, envy, pride, apathy, selfishness, no matter what you're struggling with, Jesus is here. Jesus has all power over sin and all temptation and is saying to you today, I came here to serve you. And think about your struggles with suffering. Or even if you face disappointment or depression, Jesus is your servant. Jesus wants to serve you with joy and hope. When you face pain and grief, Jesus wants to serve you with peace and comfort. Think about the families that you know who have lost loved ones this year. Christmas is going to be a hard and tender time. But know this, you're not alone. Jesus is your servant. He wants to serve you in every way way your soul needs. This text also reminds us and invites us to turn to Jesus for help. 
Jesus is with you to serve you in that moment. That moment in the doctor's office when you get the diagnosis that you never could imagine hearing. In that moment, know this, Jesus is our servant. Jesus is our servant in every circumstance that this life brings. Every single follower of Jesus within the sound of my voice, be sure of this. There's a day coming when we will take our last breath. We don't know the when. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be years from now. You don't know when. But you can know in that moment when, when, the, when you take your last breath that you'll be in the presence of this King, that you'll be in this presence of this Jesus. This is incredible news of the Bible. When we think about the incarnation, it's it's so important that we understand why Jesus came. He came to suffer like you. He came to die instead of you. He came to free you from the slavery of sin. He came to show you how to love. And He came to serve as a servant. So look to Him. Love and worship Him during this season. In that way, every moment of every day, Jesus is your servant. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Let me pray for us.